And with the logistics out of the way, um, I just want to welcome you all into this space and provide a little bit of grounding around kind of the why and the purpose of why we're gathering, particularly here today. Um, this was a session that I needed for myself. And when Heather and Jen, the amazing organizers of the PFG this year, asked for calls for uh, session topics, this is the first one that came to mind. Because as Gras Gay recently you know, reminded us that need is the ground for our gathering. And when we ask for what we need, then we're able to come together and build the possibility um, of nourishing that need and addressing it. And I just have been feeling very overwhelmed and very tired and really questioning, can I do this work for the long haul? If we're working long hours, if we're up against climate change and folks that are not receptive to our messages or folks that deny our existence or uh, people who don't see some of the, the harsh realities of our future and also don't see the immense joys, possibilities, and hope of that too. And what does it mean to be working day in and day out in the field or in community or at our, our tables and in our kitchens and just feeling worn down, tired, exhausted, and in a state of question, constant questioning? And I've been struggling on how to address this within my personal life and how to address this in my professional life. And I don't have the answer. And so I wanted to help make space and bring together folks that one might be feeling something similar at times and two might have come up with really great solutions and workarounds in ways that we can build ease and hope and possibility. And one of the greatest gifts that um, the perennial farm gathering can give us is that we're here to gather together to oftentimes solve the problems that we're facing. And so today I'm really grateful um, to be in conversation with three really amazing people. And so today we're going to be chatting with Katie Bishop, with Hanel Hemmelgarn, and with Stephanie Gutierrez and talking through how we can care for each other as we care for our work for the long haul. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, invite each of our panelists to unmute and introduce themselves. And Stephanie, would you mind going first and um, introduce yourself in whatever way you would like? And then I'd really love to, to ask the question, um, what feeling or reaction do you have to the term self-care? It's in the title, but we all have different reactions and understandings of, of what that phrase means. So thanks for being here, Stephanie. Um, hi, everyone. Dagote, she, Stephanie Gutierrez. Go and say hello. My name is Stephanie Gutierrez. Um, I'm San Carlos Apache. Um, my tribe is located in um, southeast Arizona, about 90 minutes outside of Phoenix. Um, our ancestral territories are in south or southeastern Arizona, um, New Mexico, and northern Mexico, actually. Um, and it's pretty cool fun fact. I like to tell people this is that if you overlay um, the different bands and um, clans from um, in our territories um, of Apache people, they align mostly with the Emory Oak distribution. Um, so that that is an oak tree um, and an acorn that um, San Carlos Apache people collect and it's really important to us. Um, and so I, a little bit about myself, I, um, I am a movement instructor, a consultant, um, and I'm also a uh, co-director of a forestry program um, for a nonprofit called EcoTrust. Um, and so today I'm going to be speaking about my experiences like as an individual um, coming to uh, my, my work as a nonprofit and, and, and in agroforestry too. Um, and so to me, self-care, uh, when I think about self-care, first I think about like empathy and compassion, um, not only for my myself, uh, which is really hard, <laughs> um, but for my community too. I think 
I'm really hard on myself a lot. Um, so when I think about self care, I think about uh, practicing trying to have more empathy and compassion for myself, um, just as much as I have for other people in my community. Um, and I think what that looks like in practice is um, boundary setting. It's um, creating routines. And part of that, I think, is discipline. So having that, um, you know, maybe I'm really tired and I just want to watch Netflix, but like, if I put my laundry away, it's going to make my me in a better headspace. And so I'm like, how can I do that? Well, I'll throw on Netflix and put laundry away. Um, and then I'm ready for tomorrow. Um, so it could be as simple as that. It could also be right. You go full send and have like a movement practice every single day. Um, and I do try to at least even just like breathe, you know, focus on my breath at least once a day. Um, saying no is a big part of my, um, self-care practice. Um, so saying no to new projects, advisory committees, um, opportunities, friend outings, even, um, I'm embracing, uh, my hermit (laughs) status, I guess this winter, um, and really trying to, you know, uh, I guess look to nature for inspiration and we're all quieting down um in or the plants are all quieting down and so are the animals so maybe I should too um and then the last part is like really just being okay with not being the best at everything or not doing your best at everything um and you know I think learn or you know reflect and learn what's most important to you um and and really focus on that and prioritize that um, and it's okay not to be great at, at everything else. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction, Stephanie. So happy to have you here. Hannah, I might move to you or Katie, I'm moving to you next. <laughs> okay. Hi everybody. I'm, my name is Katie Bishop and I have a farm in central Illinois with my husband. Um, This is our 16th year growing crops, but we originally started growing vegetables on just a small uh, piece of land and gradually moved up to about 80 acres of vegetables with 20 employees and just rapid, awesome growth, which is part of the reason why I'm here with you today is that was not well-planned growth. Due to a lot of reasons, some of which have to do with burnout, but there are other reasons. We decided to quit growing vegetables last year and move to just grain. So we raise organic and conventional grain. Happy to talk about all of the reasons how this all happened. But um, that left me with a lot of time to explore the things that really interested me. And so I went back to school because I thought I didn't need to finish my degree to be a farmer. But I wanted to go back. So I recently just got my degree in organizational leadership with the goal to help farmers feel confident and competent being bosses and to help them attract and retain employees and develop systems that are professional and make their employees feel motivated and excited to come to work today. Um, And while I was doing that, I also went to life coach school and got my legit accreditation. I'm a certified life coach and created a program with Fair Share CSA Coalition in Wisconsin that offers peer-to-peer farm coaching. So we are helping farmers um, deal with communication issues and conflict and work-life balance and self-care and all different types of things. So I have my hands in a lot, um, but as we kind of talk about self-care, they're all things that I absolutely love. So... um, Similar to what Stephanie says, I say no to the things that don't bring me joy and I don't instantly feel great about. That's a wonderful way that I've been able to balance myself. Um, I still have to say no to the things that I absolutely love and feel great about. It's like a buffet where everything is delicious and you want a little bit of everything and I have to say no to some of it. So part of that comes, I think self-care for me starts with self-awareness and knowing what I need and what in that moment what I need and also what I can handle. Um, And that can be even in the moment, just knowing like, wow, I'm feeling really tired. I need to do this. I need to do that. Like I need to stop doing this. I need to say no more. So for me, self-care starts with uh, self-awareness, lots of boundaries, just like what Stephanie said, lots of saying no, even to the things that I love. Um, 
But with that also comes a lot of patience and forgiveness and willingness to not be perfect. Again, like Stephanie said, I think that's really important. Um, but also embrace, embracing nothing. Like I'm in love with rest. I'm in love with doing nothing and trying to reduce that stigma that farmers shouldn't rest or that they should be, you know, productive. So that's kind of where I'm at with self-care right now. And I'm also just really excited that you guys all came today to talk about something. And I'm so grateful for the Savannah Institute for making space for this because I think it is much needed in our industry. And I'm excited that people want to, to talk and share. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Hannah? This is all so juicy already. I love it. So um, I'm Hannah Hemmelgarn. I'm the Assistant Program Director at the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. And I am looking out my window at the sunshine hitting the garden. And I, I just, I'm just feeling like a, there's so in this, like doing nothing has to be like an in the moment practice, I think, <laughs> and like presence and paying attention for me is part of that practice. So like just inviting you into the presence of my, the space that I'm in right now. Um, I'm on um, ancestral lands of the Miz Oto Missouri and uh, ancestors and descendants of Degi and Suan peoples, uh, including the Osage and Quapa and so many others that have called this place home. So I just want to call that out um, and the importance of that work, which is, I think, aligned with what we're talking about here, too, um, in part because I think just like there's this duality between like you're either resting or you're working your butt off. <laughs> And I want to bring those things together if that, you know, I think that's possible. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is a, a meditation guy who I'm, I'm in really into his writing. And um, a lot of what he writes is like, J just d don't sit down and, well, he does say sit down and meditate, but like you can just do the meditating in your life actively. Um, and, and also as part of that duality, like, um, trying to resist the binary between self care and community care that like the, we are kind of just like Ross Gay's talk was so on point for all of this, um, that we are in dependence, right? Um, with each other and there's no way around that. <clears throat> so honoring that for me to be able to take care of myself means that my community to, can help take care of me. And that means that I am also helping take care of my community. And all of that is, it's like um, all, another kind of resistance of um, the, that individualism moving towards like, what does this look like? So I'm not, I know we're going to talk about sacrificing later, but um, rather than the duality like bring it all together so that care in all the ways that it shows up is just part of our lives. We don't have to, yeah, give up something to do, to do it. Okay. That's actually a perfect segue into what I was hoping we'd kick this conversation off with was <laughs> um, this word care. We, we've used it a lot. We're going to use it a lot again. Um, it was something that Roske brought up quite a bit within um, within his keynote. And one of the things that he said, which really resonated with me, is that practices of care are the ways that we get by. And it's a really great kind of pithy phrase, but I wonder if we can spend some time unpacking that. Um, we talked about self-care a little bit. Hannah, you brought up community care. Um, what what the heck is a practice of care? What does that what does that look like? What are those things? And Stephanie and Katie um, brought us a couple of them. So the practice of saying no, the practice of giving ourselves compassion, uh, the practice of discipline, that of patience. Uh, some stuff is coming in the chat here. But what are what are those practices? And maybe ones that we don't often think of as a practice. I'm just going to throw one out because it's for anyone who was in the keynote right before this, let's think of inefficiency as a practice. And I like, you know, somebody mentioned going on walks during meetings, like trying to not do everything as quickly as you possibly can. 
there there's this thing so someone mentioned jenny odell's book how to do nothing which oh my god it's so good you gotta read it um and she talks about uh how like the or no you know what this is actually from four thousand weeks um which is also a great book i'll put a link in the chat or it's it's like a both of those are not how-to books even though you might think otherwise from the titles four thousand weeks is like about how short our lives are and um so the, one of my little mantras of inefficiency is do the next most important thing and the next most important thing very often is just like be petting my cat i'm done <laughs> Um, I could share a little bit if that's okay right now. Yeah. Um, so one of the practices I didn't really talk about, but I've found really powerful for me for self-care is having, you know, you can practice alone or you can practice in community. Um, and uh, for me, that practice is connecting with plants. Um, so I have a, you know, like building intentional spaces and that can look a like a variety of different things. It could be you visiting the same tree every day. It could be you holding a plant um, and, you know, considering like, what does this plant do? How does that relate to me? And so like these little practices like that, I feel like are really powerful for me, my space, like when I need like deep nourishment and care and I'm away from my, um, my family, you know, my, my native family, especially I, um, I have plants that I've collected from Arizona and I dry them and process them and bring them home with me. And so I create like a altar, like a space where I have um, those plants. I may have books or texts or drawings, um, you know, that I can look at routinely like throughout my day and just like having that moment of like, oh yes, I'm doing this for this. And that, that reminder. Um, and then for me, sometimes I incorporate movement to into those practices. Um, I have chronic pain. So being able to move through pain um, and move through grief and loss has been really important to me. Um, and that's why I practice yoga a lot. Um, and I've incorporated lots of like smudging for myself and not just with sage. I, I use sage because it's important to my tribe, but I also use juniper and their cedar here in the Northwest um, that I use as well. Um, and so having those plants um, and that intentional space for me to process has been really important and powerful. And you can create it for yourself too, right? It doesn't have to be just, you know, just for me. <laughs> um, gosh, I just keep going back. I think you're going to hear me use the word rest a lot because I... For me, it's been the foundation. It's been what has completely shifted my life in all of the good ways. I call rest my magic wand. And it doesn't mean sleep. It doesn't mean a nap. It could mean just sitting there doing nothing. It could mean walking out in the woods and being with plants. For me, it could be riding my bike or it could be watching Netflix. It just depends. But it's giving myself that grace to rest. Um I'm going to just share briefly with you that I worked about like everybody else, 80, 90 hours a week um, for 10, 12 years. It was pretty intense. I had a myriad of health problems that kept coming up and I ignored them and I ignored my marriage and I ignored pretty much everything. I made that choice to do that. And then I got really sick and I lost my hearing. I woke up one day deaf and unable to walk. And it was a hundred percent related to my immune system just being completely depleted. And I had to slow down. I was forced to stop working. I was forced to rest. I couldn't even stand up. And it is through that time that I realized how much I need rest. So for me, it's a practice of rest. And that looks different every single day. But I can no longer push myself, not because of this health illness, but because I can't do that to myself anymore. So rest. Yeah. I'm reading yeah. the comments. The chat's good. <laughs> yeah, the chat's always on fire in these conversations and at the the PFG. Um, this this practice of hair um, had me thinking 
in, in reading through Raskay's works the last couple of months, and then especially this keynote today, I've been thinking about the spaces in which we do practices of care. And so often it is in this individual space and sometimes in a community space. And oftentimes we don't actually bring that practice of care when we're working with folks outside of our communities or folks that we're meeting for the first time. And uh, my work especially deals with lots of different types of people that um, sometimes are excited about the work I do and sometimes are skeptical and sometimes are hostile to the, the types of work um, in perennial farming and, and agroforestry. And I, Ross Gay, I think, challenged me to think through, like, what does a practice of care look like when someone's yelling at me about a windbreak? Like, is there such thing as a practice of care in these areas of conflict? Or are there ways to build in practice of care with folks in the beginning of a relationships or, or interaction where we can model what that looks like and then invite them to join us in that practice? Seems like this, I would love to hear it. And now that we have a life coach in the room, I'm like, yeah, consultation right now. <laughs> I guess that's what's happening, sort of. Um, I was just thinking about that that example um, and how hard it is to set boundaries. It's like when we got started, I was telling Katie, my throat has, was kind of sore this morning. And I think it's because I picked something up from our parents as teachers person who came into our house coughing and sneezing and we sat together for an hour and I'm really grateful for her support. And I am regretful that I was not more brave in asking her to just reschedule or at least put a mask on. <laughs> like, um, and I'm paying the price now and like boundary setting rest is hard. And Katie, it sounds like you, Katie Bishop, you know that well, <laughs> um, having had to learn the hard way. Um, but yeah, I just, I just want to name that, like, we talk about these things as though just like, just do it, but it's, it's really hard, especially with all of the demands that are placed on us and that we place on ourselves. Um, but yeah, boundary setting. Oof. Like, I'm glad yeah. you, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm glad you said the word brave because I keep having to come back to this like well of like, how do I make myself brave? so that I can set boundaries or I can rest or I can like jump into the unknown of setting a new routine. <laughs> well, first of all, Katie, I think you are incredibly brave. I think everybody in this room would probably, who knows you, knows you as brave. And so I think you're already there. Um, it's just a shift in, in what's important for you in that moment, I think. Does that make sense? Uh, boundaries are huge. And I never, I look back at, at my farming career, and what made me work as hard and as long as I did. And it's usually because I didn't set very good boundaries. You know, I, I felt like I had to, but I think the minute you realize that you're actually making a choice every single time, it is a choice. You can be empowered to choose differently. You can choose not to do the thing that somebody wants you to do that you don't want to, or you can choose not to be in the room with someone who's ill, or you can choose to ask them once you figure out that you have that power to do that, it kind of, it shifts the story, right? If you feel like it's happening to you and you're the victim of it, then that's when like the resentment starts to build in. But when you, when you feel like when you are making those choices consciously, you can decide for yourself. But when it comes to other people and especially with employees, because you know, that's where my heart is, is with employees. I feel like farmers set this tone that, um, they everyone has to work as hard as they do. We're not necessarily setting a great example for self care for our employees or our farm staff, and so that's something that I think is really important as leaders is that we start to set that example and expect care from our employees, self care from our employees, and and show compassion and empathy towards our staff, um, but also leave space for them to express that too. And I have oh. to tell you that one of my employees is in this room and I say that, and I, we didn't do that to him. We, we expected him to work as hard as we did. And a lot of times he worked harder than us. So I just want to tell you that I don't always have all the answers and I definitely didn't back then. It's a, it's a practice. Love you, John. Sorry. <laughs>
Um, some like tools that I've found useful for setting boundaries is um, in your work notebook or planner or whatever your phone, <laughs> whatever you're, you're using for work um, to take notes on is actually write down phrases. So like if somebody's yelling at you and making you feel really uncomfortable and you're kind of just shocked in that moment, um, you know, the practice of writing it down, at least for me, helps one like ingrain it in my memory of like if somebody says something that's harmful, instead of just ignoring it, actually confronting it in the moment and just saying like that makes me feel uncomfortable or that's an odd thing for me to say or for you to say. Um, and I liked, I think someone in the comment had mentioned that Ross's approach was, can you tell me more about that? You know, I think having these written phrases down or these phrases kind of just like instilled in your, in your mind um, can help set boundaries and um, navigate conflict. Um, and you could do like a quick Google search even. And I think they're called like boundary phrases, but um, you know, when somebody's like, I need this done at this time at, you know, right now. And it's really urgent having that stockpile is really helpful, at least for me. Um, yeah. Thank you for those allies. I think there's uh, meditation was brought up a couple of times. And I think Ruske talked about this too. And then this last session is like the repeating of phrases. And it feels strange in our bodies sometimes to do these things of care. And we just, I, I find myself like sometimes getting caught in the like, this feels weird, this feels strange, instead of just like letting go and let it flow through you. Like the massage that I was talking about before we all hopped on. It's like, I don't want anyone to touch me. I refuse to engage in that, that type of care. Um, I'm going to shift this a little bit and um, talk about time. And time is often the big element, elephant in the room. And Stephanie, you brought this up in your last comment around like someone saying, I need this now. It's urgent. It has to get done. There's deadlines. Um, and there is a true reality that there's only so many hours in the day and days in the week. Um, and how do you get around this sticky time thing where everything feels urgent and important and you might have other folks um, that tell you things have to get done now? Or you might have the weather saying, like it or not, the hard freeze is coming too early or too late. Uh, what? How do you work within this very real time constraint? So that would not be the time, I think, in my opinion, to start building your self-care plan. Hopefully you've done the maintenance ahead of time so that you can navigate. Because those times, those moments of, of rush and intensity are going to happen on a farm. It's inevitable. Um, I don't think that you can necessarily, there are some things that you could do to make that a little less sticky. But for the most part, I think that if you're, you're already well fed and well hydrated and well rested, and you already have gone to the doctor and you're already taking the meds that you need to be taking, and you're already having those difficult conversations with the people that are with you, and you already know what you really love to do. I think when you have those things in place, those sticky situations aren't as sticky. Also, just the idea that they are short, they're not forever. And if they are forever, then we need to talk because something isn't right? If your life is at that RPM all the time, you know what I mean? But I do think you can't avoid that as easily as you can making sure that you're in the, in the right state of mind and your body's in the right place at the right time. I think what I struggle with, with that is, um, well, two things are coming to mind. One, <laughs> Ross Gaze, um, when he was encountering like the kids looking at their phones and the beautiful place was like, you're dying, you're dying. Um, and I, maybe this is out of context if you weren't at that session, I'm sorry. Um, but I feel like that really to me speaks to the, the crisis for me in those moments when like, after you finish this grant proposal that's due tomorrow and it's, 70 degrees out and perfect. And my child is 
you know, needing my attention. Um, and I, I honestly, I don't know what to do about that. And I think it becomes problematic when, like you're saying, Katie, w- when you get to that pace or feel like you're working at that pace on a regular basis. And um, I don't remember where this came from. I didn't think of it, but um, someone had written about how like, basically the more you take on, the more you do, the more it becomes clear that you're capable of doing that much. And so you will ask to be do, you will be asked to do that much or more. Um, And it becomes this really dangerous cycle. Um, And so, yeah, I don't know, I'm working on it, but I think like you were talking, like you both were talking about at the beginning, practicing saying no, saying no as a practice, which is hard when you really care about your work. Yeah. And you know that, that I'm sorry, Stephanie, I want to leave time for you, but I, I also want to tell you that I have found in, in my life so many times, but more so recently, because I've been really practicing. No, that when I say no to things, I'm not actually missing out on anything because it, it's like, it gives space for the stuff that I really want to come in. And it gives space for me to have the energy to pursue the things that I really, really want. And the stuff that either feels like an obligation, or, you know, maybe there's a little FOMO going on, I'm always afraid I'm going to miss out on opportunities if I don't say yes to everything. But by stepping back from everything that isn't in that, I call it the awesome bucket. It's super generic, but it's like all the great, wonderful things go in this bucket of my life. And if I keep that one, center, then I have plenty of time to focus on that good stuff. Does that make sense? Or is my awesome bucket kind of confusing? You have to be in my head to understand (laughs) my awesome bucket. Do you, just as a follow-up to that, do you like lay out this is what can count for the awesome bucket or is it an in-the-moment kind of not awesome enough, just barely awesome. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I do have it written out. Like I do have the absolutely hell no bucket and I have the awesome bucket and then I have everything in between. And like the awesome bucket is going on an international, you know, travel with Oprah Winfrey talking about, you know, coaching and all that kind of like that's in that bucket, but but there's some, I, I spread it out. So I only make time for the things that really excite me. Um, and sometimes those things come up spontaneously and I have to make that decision in the moment, like you're saying, but I consciously list out the things that I'm not going to do anymore, or I won't give my time to anymore. Yeah. Savannah Institute, look, you're an awesome. (laughs) No, I love talking to people about self-care and I love talking to farmers and talking to farmers will always be in my awesome bucket. So feels nice to be in the awesome bucket because I, I don't feel like I'm I'm in my awesome bucket sometimes. <laughs> um, going back to what you were saying, Hannah, like the, you know, like the capability thing and like when you do more work, you know, you, you sometimes get used to it or you're like, yeah, I feel capable. I can do these things. I can take on more and other people can sometimes see you as super capable and give you more. And I feel like sometimes that, that feels especially uh, hard within agroforestry at this particular moment, because there's a lot of eyes on all of us right now. And there's, I feel like there's a lot of pressure for us to get it right. And we hear these things like once in a lifetime historic funding and more people interested in this than ever before. And we're small but mighty. Um, and we just got to buckle down and do it because if we don't harness the moment now, then it, it might slip away. And I feel like that's also kind of behind so much of uh, of the saying, yes. And like, yeah, let's apply for this other grant. Let's uh, add more deliverables to what we're doing. Let's add more people to this event that we're hosting. And sometimes it can feel like the faucet never, t- we, like we, can we can't turn down the never ending faucet? Um, and I'm interested in what uh, you your experience with this, Stephanie, as someone that's also working in agroforestry, and um, if you are feeling some of these pressures and some of the things that you're incorporating in your practice. Yeah, I mean, I feel that a lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I think I'm still on the last question too. Um, so just what I wanted to add there was um, the, now I'm blanking on it. Sorry. I had it. Sorry. Like, and then I like <laughs> forgot. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. We can always um, come back. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to do the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I know what it was about. Um, so when there's like acute needs, especially like right now, right. With this like waterfall of funding or somebody saying like what you were saying earlier, Katie is like, we need this right now. What do we do? There's that sense of urgency. How do we push back against it? Um, for me, it's a lot of prioritizing and sequencing. So even like practical things that you can do today in your job is take five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, look at your calendar and be like, what can I push to next week, next month, next year? Um, I started saying no to stuff back in October and being like, let's circle back in January. Like these relationships sound great. Like let's talk in the new year. <laughs> um, and so I think like looking at your calendar and thinking, you know, it may be scary because it may be your boss being like, you need to do this right now. And I think just asking, and if your boss is scary, go to someone you trust at your org or go to someone you trust outside of your org and have them help you like craft that message and be really clear with what you need in this moment. Because a lot of times I think we don't even have the space to think about what we need. And so taking yes. that like five, 10, 15 minutes to actually just like sit and be like, what do I need right now to get through this next meeting, this day, this week? you know, this project, um, that's, that's, what's been really helpful for me in, um, addressing the sense of urgency and like, yes, with this waterfall of funding and also being, you know, being native and wanting to like represent and step up for my like community and also just like people of color and black and indigenous people, like just making space for folks, you know, I think about that, like, who can I bring to meetings? Who can I like, step back and like, let them take the center. Um, and, and so with this funding, I think about, I do think about like, you know, if we're all like in a canoe, we have this like metaphor at my work, but if we're in a canoe, then sometimes there's times to paddle and sometimes there's time to rest. And I really feel right now, at least like for me, I, I feel a responsibility to paddle hard for my community. I feel a responsibility to, create the space in my life for, uh, you know, to support others in that way. And it doesn't have to be like some big giant thing, you know, it could be like, I think when I think of allyship, and I think a lot of us have questions around that, um, like how to be a better ally, it's training and education for yourself. That way, like, my community or myself don't have to spend, you know, the first hour of our meeting or half hour, just being like, here's my community, like do the work beforehand, learn about the community or the partner that you're working with beforehand. You know, it doesn't have to be just like a BIPOC, um, you know, like person do the work that of, or organization and do the work before to know your partners. I think that holds true for anyone that you're working with that way. They don't have to teach you, you know, in the first half of your meeting or the time that they have, and you can actually get to like, what do they really need and how can I best support them? Um, kind of went off on a tangent there, but I think like they're all like all of that's interconnected, you know, for care for yourself and care for your community and others and how to show up. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that into the conversation because it has to be centered with the way we approach this, right? Because if we just focus on self care for us or self care for the communities that we spend the most time with, then we just eschew the needs of other folks. And there's really small ways that we can build a lot of power for community care for other folks as well. And I wonder with it, oh, go ahead, Hannah. Well, I was just gonna say, I would love to bring that back to something that Stephanie, Stephanie and I had talked about in a previous conversation um, around privilege and self-care. And um, I think there is something to like, if you are someone who has the privilege to spend the time to re-envision the systems that aren't working <laughs> and even do some of that really important system change like that is the you know because it's if our 
if our communities aren't set up, if the systems and the structures we work within aren't set up for us to be able to take care of ourselves or for our community to take care of itself and all of it all in, you know, intertwined, then it's just, it feels like pushing a giant rock up a hill, you know? And that's where I think like when, when there are little cracks, like there's like, okay, I can do this work to make this different for the future. Um, and maybe it's temporary, but um, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that's making sense. Big, <laughs> there's so much big work in it, but yeah, it feels really important. I think I also, Hannah, you had a great metaphor, like when we talked earlier or like in previous conversations, just around like glass and rubber balls. <laughs> oh, I think that was yeah. Katie's actually. Or was that yeah, Katie? Jen brought it up. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that right now, but. Yeah, one of the, and I, Jen's accredited this to me, but I don't think I said it. Maybe I did. I don't know. Um, But thinking about, we're all juggling balls um, at all times. We have lots of different things that we're trying to keep in the air all at once. And you're going to have to drop some, especially as more get added. It's just a fact. Um, And some of those things are rubber and they'll bounce back up or they'll bounce and stay on the ground. You can pick them back up and that's fine. Like let them, let all those drop. Like they'll still be there. Nothing, no harm, no foul. And some of them, but some of them are glass, which means that if you don't keep them in the air and hand them off to the next thing, they're going to shatter and you can't go back. And trying to figure out and work with others to figure out which ones are glass and which ones are rubber. And those can change at any time, right? Context and is important. And sometimes you have more capacity and more partners that can help juggle those balls. Um, but that glass and rubber metaphor, I think, is especially important. And once you were sharing, Stephanie, about allyship and that if allyship is always a rubber ball, it's never going to get picked up. And mm-hmm. so I th- that prioritizing, I think, is really important. Yeah, I think, I think that, but also like, I think, um, sometimes like I'll, I'll just speak from my experience as like a Brown native person, um, and working in a nonprofit field and in agroforestry, sometimes I'm the only person that knows how to carry that glass ball. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we may feel like I'm the only person and you have so much like pressure on you to carry that. And you don't know who to hand it off to because one, you may not trust, and I'm working on that, (laughs) you know? trusting and hoping that someone can carry that glass ball. Um, And that could be a partner relationship. It could be a grant. It could be an event, whatever it may be. Um, And, and so also thinking about like, how do I kind of like hold this? Maybe I'm like slowly passing it off and like training someone else, right. That allyship Mm. um, and that partnership, right. With other folks is how, how can we share all of that load? Um, together. Um, and I think like, that's where like the, the work, like, at, like learning, showing up in community, that's the type of like training that you could do for on your own to show up for other people so that you could help them then carry like that glass ball also. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that. Stephanie, just being here and, ex- and telling your story and talking to us about this is also really helpful. So thank you for that, for those reminders. We got to we gotta build stronger hands so we can help with all yeah. the balls, right? <laughs> if anyone wants to write a grant for me, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Fundraisers, <That's> a- anyone? <laughs> I think that's actually a really good, like, say what you need, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's one way that we can show up for each other, right? Is if you have particular skills that are easy for you, but maybe harder for other folks to share them. Like grant writing is something that some of us are getting good at or really good at. And it might not take that much time to share an hour or look over a grant proposal and make edits or Help be like, I'll walk you through how to apply for a government grant, which is a nightmare. So that it's not going to take you two days. It'll take you an hour, right? I think the flip side to that is we were talking about practices of self-care, getting into the practice of asking for help instead of 
wishing or hoping that somebody would help or just identifying the need, but not sharing that need is also a really important form of self-care is because you can't do it all yourself. Sometimes it's hard to even verbalize what you need. You're so tired and you're like ping ponging from place to place to place. And someone goes, Hey, I want to help you. What can I do? It so overwhelms that you actually can't give a straight answer or you can't even think clear enough to like be like, I need help with this. And these are the five steps to do that. What would happen though, if you asked before you got to that point? It would probably be easier. (laughs) (laughs) I think there is also something that, I mean, grant writing It sometimes just feels feel like this is my thing. I'm the only one who can do this. So I'm I'm with you, Stephanie. I don't think I would feel comfortable handing off something like that. And there are some things that just like really cannot be handed off. Like uh, when I need to wake up in the middle of the night to lay with my child. Like (laughs) um, I don't know. And that's where a lot of the exhaustion comes from for me (laughs) before the day even starts. Um, But. Yeah, gosh. I mean, I feel like all of the, it kind of just like funnels back to the way our society is structured these days. I think a lot of people are resisting this also and creating new ways of doing this. But like, you know, I live in this single family household where I don't have multiple generations here to support me in the middle of the night. And it would be really nice to have that. But also probably drive me nuts, but (laughs) that's learning too. But what it really excited me about this panel was that we're talking about it, which is more than I think a lot of other agricultural um, niches are. And so the fact that we're even talking about this now and giving space and so many people are interested in sharing in the conversation gives me incredible amount of hope about a revolution that's going to, you know, that we're not going to continue to let agriculture of an industry have this kind of effect on us anymore we're, we're going to choose not to follow that what did we call it in a meeting before that myth that we have to work this hard or it has to be this way yeah i think there's this in our conversation um a couple of days ago katie we were talking a little bit about sacrifice um and that oftentimes conversations around care and rest is often around like uh I'm going to, I have to sacrifice this thing to build space for this. Or, well, this work is just full of sacrifice because like you were saying with farming, like it's just the way it is. Farming's a lifestyle or, you know, we're building a movement. You have to sacrifice if you're doing something new. And I wonder if there's particular things that this term sacrifice brings up for each of you in the way that we're thinking about what we need and how to frame that, Um, maybe it even shifted into a frame of abundance rather than sacrifice. Are you asking me directly? I wanna make sure that I'm leaving plenty of space for everybody else to talk. Oh, I'm muted. Yeah, I, it was a it was a conversation oh, or a okay. question for everyone. So if the if you're moved to answer, feel free. All right, I'm going to answer because this is kind of a personal one for me. Um, I sacrificed a lot. That's what I choose to call it at the time, was that I sacrificed time with my family. I sacrificed going to school. I sacrificed my body. And that's how I would always use that term. But when I look back, I think sacrifice is more like a victim word. And I choose, I want to look at it from the standpoint of I chose that in that moment. You know, I chose to work that much. I didn't have to. I chose to do what I did. And when I make the decision to change the the words that I use, it actually doesn't feel so bad, right? Like I chose to not go see my niece's chorus performance and her plays and go to her birthdays because I chose to work instead. And when I, yeah, when I say it that way, not only do I take accountability for the fact that these are mostly choices for me, they're my choices, right? Not everybody has the same. It's not always a choice for everybody else, but it is a choice for me. And it also allows me to know that moving forward, I don't have to make those same choices. It doesn't have to be a sacrifice. It's a choice. So 
that's what I, that's what comes to mind when I think about sacrifice is that I held on to a lot of anger and resentment when I looked at it as a sacrifice. I like what Poppy said and hi, Snow Call me um, over in the Northwest. Um, I like what Poppy says in the chat about just like owning our choices is so empowering. Um, I, and I really appreciate Katie, how you were talk you kind of made that shift from like sacrifice to to then be like no this is a choice because a lot of things that I make in my life or a lot of the um I guess decision points in my life about do I do do I give up this for this they're all choices that I'm making um for me personally I don't use the term sacrifice just because of when I think of sacrifice, I think like there's not only in like my culture but, or my ancestors and my family that there are things that I, I compare like my sacrifice, like working late and not having dinner with my family to something that they did. That's like, you know, I don't want to bring it up here, but there's people I think every day who are making sacrifices. Um, and, and I just, I just feel like what I'm, what I'm doing is more choices that I'm making, um, in, in my life. Yeah. yeah. Everything is so, um, so much more complex, I think, <laughs> as we peel back layers and just, I mean, listening to both of you and just honoring what, what I hear from both of you, it, um, I'm really inspired and in thinking about like, how can I own the choices that I'm making, uh, and also I feel like I, I am someone who can make choices. Um, and I, I realize that a lot of people don't at least have nearly as many choices or making a choice might mean something really tragic, um, as an alternative. And, um, yeah, uh, Yeah, Hannah, I feel like it, when it when it means that, that's not sacrifice, that's exploitation. When yes, they definitely. when they can't make that choice, yeah. that's exploitation. Right. And that's right. a problem. Yeah. 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 That's a huge problem, a big in, problem. in agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, this 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 conversation around choice and exploit exploitation, it, it's it's salient everywhere, but I think is particularly salient within agriculture because it is a it is a history built on exploitation it's linked to you know dispossession of land it's linked to genocide it's linked to enslavement and all of these this history of choice and exploitation is informs all of the quote unquote agricultural choices we make in the present and um, that is a really tough kind of reality and history to confront um, and is especially hard when we're asking folks to make different choices where there's a different level of urgency or even responsibility where we see choices as ha carrying a high level of responsibility and other folks don't or have a different understanding of what that responsibility is. I think that ties in so nicely to what Uzula just put in the chat too, mm -hmm. um, about thinking, thinking of her work as offering rather than sacrifice as being something more transactional. Um, and I think even the language we use that th it affects the way we think about our relationship with the land. And so, yeah, thinking, I love that, Azula, um, thinking of, of what I'm doing as an offering and like, it's a, it's a joy, um, usually. <laughs> and if it isn't, maybe it's not in the awesome bucket. Yeah, this this reframing and I think is is one one of the tools that I've try been trying to use with guides, you know, like the um Raske and Robin Wall Kimmer and each of you here and all the people that I interact with who are, you know, are are good reminders, care reminders that yeah, what we are doing is kinship and it is offering 
of service and care and intention and community and love. Um, but it, I can do that for myself, but how do I share that with other people that haven't gotten there yet or have a different framing? How do we invite them to the table of care? I think modeling goes a long way. Um, I don't remember who was saying about like having, making sure that coworkers or staff or whoever you're working with, um, that you're making that space for, for that new kind of way of being in, in the work, um, to happen. That feels so important, um, in what I'm doing. And like, it's always number one is your well being. Cause if you don't, if your well being isn't intact, then nothing can happen well. So. Um. Yeah, I love that, Hannah. It's about uh, changing the culture, I think. And that starts with you being a model of that and then expecting and being empathetic towards the people around you on your team or your customers or your fellow farmers. But it, it's it spreads. I think you influence other people. So we're, we have 15 minutes left of our session and I wonder, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll open, I'll ask the same question to the audience, um, which is, what do you need to do this work for the long haul? What other need needs do you have that we can collectively help support or build power for? I'll, I'll start with one that's bigger than agroforestry. But I really need reliable childcare. <laughs> That's like a big, reliable, trustworthy childcare rooted in community where I feel excited for my child to go spend lots of time away from me. <laughs> that would go a long way for me to be able to do this work for the long haul. So sort uh, of to the, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Katie. If you have no, 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 yeah, go ahead. I it's related. Just, go ahead. Um, like for childcare for, I am lucky enough that I've, I've got pretty good childcare situation right now. Um, and, uh, what I feel like is, is really a big part of that for me is that I trust the people who are caring for my child. And I feel like what I need is trust across all of the different layers of this, um, trust for other people and like you were talking about, Stephanie, like if I can just trust the other people to hold the glass balls, then maybe we can try this. Um, and and also then like I need it back to me that people trust that I can get done what needs to get done. Or like I, there's actually something that I I'm just reading the Book of Delights now. And um, there was a passage that I just read last night that's like, isn't everything always a warm up? Like just recognizing that we're all just trying. And and I, I think it comes back to the failure piece, but like trusting myself to be present with failures and to be able to move through them, with which is sometimes not a great skill of mine, but <laughs> um, but I'm working on it. So yeah, trust is, I think, at the core of it for me. I love that. I was going to say affordable and accessible mental health care, I think is huge and needs to be and stigma free mental health care, especially for farmers. Um, but I kind of want to build on what Hannah said and say grace. I think I need grace from everybody in my, in my life to let me fall, fail and to not expect a perfection or a level that I can't get to. And part of that is also grace of myself, letting myself not, Letting myself drop all those rubber balls over and over and over again and just keep going and being proud of my efforts instead of worrying about trying to be perfect. So, yeah, grace and mental health care. Um, I need a trusted partner, like a confidant. And, you know, I have like my partners and community outside of work that I think really helps support me show up to my work. Um, and sometimes those communities overlap. Um, but I think having like a trusted partner and an ally, a confidant co-conspirator in within your field is really helpful. Someone that you can call and 
you know, just ask for advice or just be like, I had a really bad day. Can I tell you what happened? Or like, I have a really bad day. Can you tell me something great? <laughs> like, you know, make me feel like a little bit better. <laughs> um, and I do want to address a little bit, or I don't know, or sorry, I'll pause, but I, I do want to get to Kaylee's question in the chat. Um, go for at it. Some point. Okay. Um, so Kaylee, uh, had asked like what happens when we are in positions of employment that help us feed families and survive saying no has implications. Um, self-care has become its own industry. And it seems like a lot of additional work to have time off. Um, and it's like, what do we do when everything about our lives is recolonized, co-opted and commodified? Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't have an answer. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I can just offer my experiences um, because I think I don't know you, Kaylee. I don't, I don't know your specific position and I don't know if you have a choice or not. um, And it sounds like you may not. Um, But in times where I feel very stuck and stagnant and there's no way out, um, I set small, like measurable goals, like dates, like I can make it through today And then I'm going to, you know, maybe find, think about something in my life that hasn't been colonized, co-opted or commodified, you know, like where are those spaces? Where's the active like space that's like, you know, I guess, indigenizing or decolonizing that. Um, I think about like very, very small. I take things really slow and small and it may be like a month or two months, you know, and if you are in a position where you can't, Um, you know, you can't say no in your employment, um, current employment situation. I also go to like, what are my rights? Like, what are my legal rights? And, you know, if your employer offers um, legal counsel, I've actually considered consulting like the free legal consultation. I refer to my employee handbook all the time. Um, I have felt very stuck before um, and that I can't say no. And at that point, I consult outside of my work for help. Um, So I think maybe that's what it is. It's like seeking help, too. And that's what I've done in my experience. Um, And I'm going to be honest here. Some of the best things, and I don't don't have children. I have two dogs and a cat um, and a wonderful partner and husband. Um, Same person. (laughs) But uh, I, I, one of the best things that ever happened to me was I did get fired. Cause I felt like I couldn't and I, um, I got let go. It was a mutual, um, separation where they didn't renew my contract and I didn't want to pursue the contract either. And I was, um, unemployed for like four or five months. But during that time it was, you know, I did get to receive unemployment. Um, and I accessed all the benefits during unemployment, including like SNAP benefits, um, and, uh, just like food stamps, I guess. Um, but during that time, it gave me the space to think about what I really wanted. And it, like, I was okay. Like I did have, um, as I don't, you know, it, it was space and time and there was some money. It wasn't a lot, but it did give me that space and time. And it, it got me out of that situation and that employment where I thought I couldn't say no. Um, yeah. And now I'm here. And I direct a program, so, <laughs> and I have like a consulting business, so there is a future, I think, outside of that. I wonder Katie, if you I just want to thank, oh, I'm sorry, on. Hannah, you and I are just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Hannah, I just want to, or, or Kaylee, I'm sorry, I just wanted to thank you for the reminder that not everybody is in that position to say no, when or not everybody is in that position to have an awesome bucket and only live by the awesome bucket. So I, I just want to, I, I also, um, you know, there, I have little things that I do that whether it's taking five minutes to not be on my phone and to go for a walk. I mean, there's lots of little things that I can do that don't cost any money and that are very quick and don't take a ton of time. But the, I think the bigger answer to your question is not those little things. I think I'm sure you know about how to take care of yourself. It's just those not being able to say no to the demands that your employer has on you. And so I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate your perspective. Yeah. And just to build off of what you all are sharing, 
another, I, I wasn't sure if I was interpreting the question correctly, um, but thinking about it as like, there are people whose lives are depending on me not saying no, um, or like the glass balls. If you have a whole lot of glass balls um, and it's just not sustainable for your well-being, then it's not sustainable for the people's well-beings who are connected to your work. Um, you're saying yes. And I've definitely felt that also. And um, yeah, and it, you know how real that is? I don't know. For like in my own situation, I don't know um, for others, but um, yeah, it, that can be a real big source of stress. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Brandon in the chat. Could we talk about uh, a bit about particular difficulties having to do with perennial systems where urgency may not be easy to gauge and many tasks are in some way forever? Something you'll never cross off your to-do list that would bring a lot less stress to your life. This is something that I know at least Katie Adams and I have talked about because, you know, we we are in relationship with trees. All of us here are, I think, and trees are living at a different pace. Um, you know, and like the just the um, the the speed of things right now of um, like what Stephanie was talking about this like big influx of funding and all the there there's just like there's a lot of excitement and it's amazing. And it, it feels really urgent. And that is not how trees operate. Um, and I think really digging into that, sinking into that reality is so important for the long haul of caring, tending um, ourselves in relationship with trees. So um, I'm just going to put that seed out there. It's not really a complete thought, but I want to hear what Katie and Stephanie have on their minds, too. And then maybe there would be more. Yeah, I often feel this tension with the rate that our work is moving now and the rate of tree growth. And if we're not modeling the way that we, the slow, intentional kind of way that we build our systems or we build our systems in relationships with fast growing things and slower growing things and, um, we're we're gonna get it wrong. I I don't know. This is a personal feeling, but if we don't follow the, the time span of trees, then we're gonna get it wrong. And I don't know how to address that. Besides, like thinking through if I'm thinking about the ways that you know my husband John, who, who was on this color, I don't know if he still is. The way that we did work in the apple orchard was that we'd intensively prune for weeks at a time. And then we just wouldn't go to the orchard for a while. And then we'd come back and we'd do work or jam and spray or things like that. And then we'd leave. And then we'd, you know, and then we'd come back when there were other tasks that need to be done. And there was this push and then a release or a rest and push and a rest. And right now we're working in push, 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 push. And we're not, there's no intentional rest that Katie was talking about earlier baked into the structure or baked into the grant proposal or baked into the way that we're planning or the way that we're trying to track sometimes our management and things like that. Um, and like, what if rest was a task on the list? What if not doing something for three months at a time was an intentional part of a deliverable or was an intentional part of loans where you got the money and there was a rest period while the trees were growing and then there was a repayment period. And so there's no space right now within any of our structures for the pace of working with trees. But I think we have to model it in that way if we're going to be successful at it. I think that's really interesting because I don't, I'm actually an annual, I grow vegetables, annual vegetables. So I have no experience. I love trees. They're like my best friends, but I don't actually grow any trees. Um, you know, with 
with vegetables, uh, so many of my annual farmer friends, they don't farm over the winter and that's when they're supposed to be resting. Only we started to, a lot of us started like season extension and root storage and winter CSA and all these other things that encroached on that rest time. And so now a lot of us don't have any time off to rest. So I love that idea, Katie, to kind of model your trees and build in some rest. Let me tell you, it's a really hard sell. No one likes that. <laughs> I should say people in decision making don't yeah. tend to like that very much. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're the only ones that can change that system. <laughs> yeah. I wonder that it, there's a uh, that that uh, rhymes a little bit with something earlier about planning the maintenance because the maintenance is what you're going to be doing. <laughs> forever uh, yeah. and, and it doesn't often get planned uh, so it's, it seems like a, a, a rhyming need there yeah. maintaining this <laughs> <laughs> uh, Renee says collective bargaining can also help with that yeah Well, we're nearing the end of our time together. Um, and I wonder, Stephanie and, and Katie and Hannah, if there's uh, any small gifts of care that you can leave for for everyone here. What what are you inviting us to do as we leave this space? Well, I just heard my my partner and child come into the house. And so I am going to repeat that mantra I mentioned earlier about doing the next most actually important thing, which for me after this will be being with my family. Um, so go do the next most important thing for you that's in your awesome bucket, <laughs> however <laughs> however you figure out what that thing is um, that's going to help you sustain your well-being, which will help your the rest of your world sustain its well-being. And on and on and on. Um, I like the broken record. I'm going to go rest after this. Actually, this is my last bit of work for the day. And um, I'm going to go join my family as well, which I'm excited about. But I would like to just invite everybody to find a moment of rest that isn't napping or watching Netflix. Figure out or being on your phone. Find something that you love and call it rest and then commit to it. Um, I want everyone to go outside. And if you're not able to go outside, maybe look at a photo on your phone or a video stream of some nature. <laughs> um, and I think my invitation is to go outside and like, or look at the screen, the nature photo and take a breath and while looking at it and yeah, say hello to a tree um, and ask, ask yourself like, what inspiration can I draw from this? Um, what can I learn from this? And it could be like a cirrus cloud. It could be, you know, a cumulus cloud. It could be, I don't know, a raindrop. It's pretty like foggy and rainy and like typical Northwest day here. Um, that's why lots of rain metaphors. That's my invitation to you. Well, thank you to Stephanie, Katie, and Hannah for joining this conversation today. And thanks everyone that joined us and held space um, as we figure out what care means and how to do it for each other. And I feel nourished and like I have a really healthy list of things to incorporate. So thank you for answering my call to help and, and for being here today. And go rest. Thank you. And be cared for. Yeah. Thanks, all.